Secretary. So, this morning we are in 1 Samuel, and I'm taking large chunks because we are working through David's life. So we're going to do two chapters today, chapter 21 and 22. I'm not going to read all those before we start because I like to read it as we get to it in, in the break down the points that we have. So let me just open us in prayer and then we will get to it. Almighty, eternal, and merciful God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Open and illuminate our hearts and minds this morning that we may better understand your word and conform our lives to what we've understood. In the nourishing, saving name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Twelve miles outside of Prague in the Czech Republic, there used to be a small town called Lidice. In 1942, a man named Reinhard Heydrich was a top Nazi leader who had both overseen the, it was called Czechoslovakia at the time, the occupation by the Nazi troops, but he had also helped develop the final solution, right? The mass murder of German Jews. So he was identified by Allied forces as a top target to take out. So British special forces had trained two men of Czech identity uh, to carry out an assassination on Heydrich. When it all went down and Hitler was told of the attack, he flew into a rage and ordered his men to kill 10,000 Czech citizens as revenge. Thankfully, his advisors talked him out of that plan, of that huge number, but they decided instead to destroy the town of Lidice, despite any evidence connecting the assassination or the, or the assassins to it. And so Nazi soldiers drove in to this town, rounded everyone out, separated the men and the boys, shot them, and sent the women and children away to concentration camps, and then burned, destroyed the entire town, which they actually filmed. The annihilation of Lidic became international news that came to symbolize Nazi brutality. In today's scripture passage, we have a similar brutal overreaction where an entire village was destroyed and its inhabitants put to death as revenge for cooperating with the enemy. This was almost 3,000 years before World War II, but it also involved an insane, murderous head of the country who needed to send a message to anyone who would dare to oppose him. Now, if you haven't been with us for the last few sermons on the life of King David, the main thing you need to know coming into these two chapters is that the current king, King Saul, has been intensely jealous of David, of his military prowess, of people praising him, and of his knowing that David was meant for the throne. And so Saul sought to kill him any chance he got. Now he's been thwarted, he's been obstructed by his own children, by circumstances, and by the Lord's direct intervention. But Saul's no quitter. He's going to keep trying. And today there will be great collateral damage in the hunt for his rival. Now... David has had to abandon his home, his new wife, his station in the palace, even his position in Saul's army, his captain. He was homeless and a fugitive from the crown with no supplies or provisions, we're going to find out. But he had a will to live that would carry him far. And he had a Lord who was protecting and providing for him. Now, leaving the reach of Saul meant going to cities where he might get help. But he had to be careful to whom he revealed his identity. So, the first 15 verses tell how David 
deceived the distant. I'm not trying to make everything with these. You'll, you'll see. It'll, it'll work with the later points, uh, but our first point, David deceived the distance. I'm going to read, uh, it's actually the whole, all of chapter 15, uh, sorry, 21, all 15 verses of chapter 21. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David trembling and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? And David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with a matter, and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you, and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread, or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread. If the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest, Truly women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? And so the priest gave him the holy bread. For there was no bread there but the bread of the presence which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg, the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. Then David said to Ahimelech, Then have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is none but that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it to me. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as, mad, as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? David's first stop after fleeing from Saul, getting out of town, was to go to the city of the priests. It's going to be described later. Nob is the name of the city of the priests. And he goes to the high priest, Ahimelech, hoping to get food and supplies from him. Now, as I said, he wasn't ready to advertise that he was fleeing Saul. So he had to come up with a cover story of going on an errand for the king. Pretty flimsy story for someone who had not packed food or weapons, but he has a quick lie for that as well. The king's business required haste. Ahimelech, his main concern was whether David's men had made themselves ritually unclean. That's why the question about women been kept from them. Uh, And David assured them that they had not been with women, which wasn't hard to deny since there weren't any actual men with him yet. The fictional men with him. So Ahimelech gave him the only food around, which was the bread of the presence. Now we've seen that if you've studied the Old Testament. I think we saw it in Deuteronomy. But in Leviticus, it describes what the bread of the presence is for. It's put out, as it says, warm for a time for the Lord as an offering. But then when it's removed, it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, since it is for him a most holy portion out of the Lord's food offerings, a perpetual due. Now, David was not a priest. 
So he shouldn't have been given this bread, right? But there was a higher principle at work. And we actually find out that Ahimelech made the right choice in giving it to him. How do we know that? Luke chapter 6, Jesus commended him. The first five verses of Luke 6. On a Sabbath, while he, Jesus, was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered, have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So if the Lord's anointed, David in ancient Israel, could eat the holy bread in the tabernacle, that, meant, that was meant for only priests, then the Lord's anointed, a thousand years later, could eat grain on the Sabbath day. Ahimelech, letting David eat this bread, broke the letter of the law, but kept the spirit of the law. This was feeding the hungry, loving your neighbor. And Jesus was saying, if David could override this law without blame, how much more can the greater son of David do so? Now I want you to look at verse 7, put a mental asterisk next to verse 7, where it says that Doeg the Edomite was there that day. This will be significant in the next chapter. Just hold on to that thought. And then in verses 8 and 9, uh, the other thing that David needed was a weapon of some sort. And so Ahimelech somehow had gotten possession of Goliath's sword. So he gets it to him. Remember, this is the sword that David cut Goliath's head off with. Right? He took it from him. And then where did D David go from there, hoping to elude Saul, to get out of his reach? He goes to Gath, which doesn't say here, but it's one of the five main Philistine cities. Do you remember where Goliath was from? Gath. David marching into town with the sword of the former champion in tow. And it seems like he does not think that he will be recognized. He's immediately recognized, right? Isn't that David, the guy they sing about in Israel? So in fear, he decided that if he acted insane, that that would disgust them, that that would leave him alone. It was the only chance. He wasn't going to fight his way out of this, as many of the 10,000 as he had killed, but he was, it says, in their hands, so apprehended. So let me pull the insane card. And it worked. But think about what else better symbolized the Lord's ability to keep David safe than Goliath's sword, right? God delivered David from the great champion, had guided him to victory that day, but now that David was on the run, he was acting in fear. Robert Chisholm comments that David's attempts at self-preservation, which involved lying to a priest, trusting in a defeated enemy's weapon and seeking a position in the army of a Philistine ruler have backfired. He cannot escape his past or his destiny. Ironically, the Philistines remind him of both when they call him the king of the land and recall his fame as a warrior. How far David has fallen at this point. He had once been the great champion over the Philistines. And the commander of the king's army, now he's drooling and clawing and getting kicked out of town by the disgusted Philistine ruler. He was not even worth killing. Just remove him from my presence. So he went from being among the enemy to hiding in a cave, where our second point is David gathered the disenchanted. 
So in the next, the first five verses of chapter 22. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went there, down there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. And David went from there to Mizpah of Moab. And he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother stay with you so I know what God will do for me. And he left them with the king of Moab and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad said to David, Do not remain in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. You know that you're a true outlaw when you're hiding in a cave, right? Doesn't seem like Saul knew where to find David, but apparently everyone else did, right? His family, who must have sensed their danger or perhaps been threatened by Saul's forces, went and found David. And then it says that everyone else who was in debt or bitter or disillusioned towards the king, we're assuming, knew where he was. Now, David had been the commander of Saul's armies. As I said, now he was the commander of this small group of cast-offs, of malcontents. And you get this picture of like a Robin Hood in the forest gathering his band of merry men. Better than being alone, I suppose, but it's a reminder of how far he's fallen. It's also a foreshadowing, a lot of, a lot of mental asterisks if you, or if you want to write in your Bible. It's a foreshadowing of something that will happen in the future with his son, Absalom. David's parents apparently needed to be kept safe from Saul's reach, but I'm assuming that life on the run was not going to work for them. I uh, must have been much older. So the king of Moab was tasked with keeping them until David returned. So he says, the Lord help me know what's going to happen. Uh, but there's another, that, so there's a, a connection there that's not really mentioned in the text, but it's brought out in all the commentaries I read. Who, who was David's great-grandmother? Or actually, if you look in Chronicles, it's great-great, but um, Ruth, the one whose book is right before 1 Samuel. And where was she from? Moab. Right? So the king of Moab's Ruth was an outsider from Israel, but she was David's ancestor. And so perhaps that Moabite king knew of it, and he honors David's family connection. There's not going to be a head-to-head here. Uh, Saul is not going to catch up to David yet. There's a lot coming in the text. But David is told, a prophet, prophet Gad comes to him, says, leave the cave, go to Judah. In the meantime... Saul executed the disloyal. That's our last point. Saul executed the disloyal. So let's read verses 6 through 23. Now Saul heard that David was discovered and the men who were with him. Saul was sitting at Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand. He's always got his spear in his hand, right? And all his servants were standing about him. And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds that all of you have conspired against me? No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, remember him back in verse 7 in the previous chapter, who stood by the servants of Saul. I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And he acquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent to summon Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests who were at Nob and all of them, came to the king. And Saul said, 
here now, son of Ahitub? And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him, so that he has risen against me to lie in wait as at this day? Then Ahimelech answered the king, And who among all your servants is so faithful as David? Who is the king's son-in-law and captain over your bodyguard and honored in your house? It's today the first time that I have inquired of God for him. No, let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of my father. For your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. And the king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David. And they knew that he fled and did not disclose it to me. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. Then the king said to Doeg, You turn and strike the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned and struck down the priests. And he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen ephod. And Nob, the city of the priests, he put to the sword, both man and woman, child and infant, ox, donkey and sheep, he put to the sword. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I know, I knew on that day, when Doeg the Edomite was there, that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me you shall be in safekeeping. The most recognizable quote from Joseph Heller's novel Catch-22 is just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't after you. I'm sure you've heard that. You may not have known where it came from. We see this obsession with staying in power and keeping people in line that can cause you to see enemies where they don't exist. Paranoia skews reality as the imagination assigns the worst motives to people. Saul was in full paranoid frenzy in this passage as he accused his servants of conspiring against him and of believing that they would be treated better by David. At the very least, they had not helped him and take pity on him, right? And had failed to inform him of Jonathan's alliance, his covenant with David. Now his accusations just hung in the air, unanswered by the servants, until the foreigner, Doeg, the Edomite, spoke up with what he knew. Ahimelech, the priest, has aided and abetted the fugitive, David. I saw it with my own eye. And so Ahimelech gets hauled in front of Saul, all the priests with him, and accused of conspiracy. And in response, we, we hear the priest's confusion, right? He says, isn't David the most faithful servant you have? It, didn't he just marry your daughter? Isn't he the captain of the guard? He's honored in your house. I've always prayed for him. What have I done wrong? Don't accuse me of conspiring against you, essentially. Now, Saul has relented in the past. For instance, like when Jonathan spoke logic to him. But he was way past that here. And would not be bothered with the facts or trying to sort out whether Ahimelech was lying or not. He accused all of the other priests of knowing about David and keeping their secret as well. In his paranoid state, he pronounced a death sentence then and there for every single one of them. 
But no one would carry it out, right? Saul's servants, they knew this was an abomination. We can't, none of them is going to kill these priests. But there's always someone willing to commit horrible crimes, to look good, to score points with the king. And that man was the villain here, Doeg, the tattletale. Eugene Peterson comments that Doeg is described in our text as chief of Saul's herdsmen, but recent textual studies have found evidence to redefine him as chief of Saul's palace guard. In our society, that label would translate into something like head of Saul's secret police. Now, I mentioned last week that Jonathan has become one of my favorite people in all of the scriptures. Doeg is probably one of my least, right? He didn't just put 85 priests to death. He destroyed every person and animal in the whole city. This was unprovoked murder, genocide, ordered by the king of Israel, purely motivated by his paranoid anger. If God had not already taken his blessing away from Saul, he surely would have now. And this incident certainly proved that God was justified in taking away the kingship from him. It shows that if Saul has put God's priests to death, then no one is safe as he hunts down David. The message is sent to the rest of the land that anyone who helped David would suffer the same fate. One loose end that escapes, right? One of the priest's sons, Abiathar, escaped and informed David. And David takes the blame for the massacre. Clearly, David underestimated the severity of Saul's response to Ahimelech's helping him. Of course, Saul, the king, was entirely to blame. And we see this. The, the priests died as what we'd call collateral damage in David's cause. In the same way that the innocent babies in Egypt died as Moses was saved. Or the infant babies in Bethlehem died when Jesus was a baby. In both those cases, the rulers of the land sending out a death order for all the babies under two. And so the least David can do is offer Abiathar safe harbor, which he does. Now it's interesting that we aren't given a lot of David's inner thoughts in this narrative. We only read his words and his actions. We can kind of guess what he's thinking, and then certainly he's feeling guilty here at the end, but we thankfully have the Psalms where we can gain great insight into his state of mind as we look at the parallel psalms that he wrote as these events happened to him. And it's interesting, there's a psalm for each one of these three sections of our text. So the first one is Psalm 34. And the inscription there is, of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, which is another name for Achish, the Philistine commander, so that he drove him out and he went away. Listen to just few, a few of the verses from Psalm 34. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. Verse 17, 18. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. David rejoiced that he was released from the Philistines. And he sees it as one example in many of the Lord delivering his people, those who fear him. Now, the second one is Psalm 142. And it has the inscription, a mascal of David when he was in the cave. A prayer. And we hear the desperation and desire for deliverance in his words. He says, with my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. 
When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. You can imagine David writing this or singing this in the cave, right? I've brought low, and I need deliverance from my persecutors, Lord. The righteous will surround me as the men come to him. The last one is Psalm 52, and its inscription is a mascal of David when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. How specific is that? And we hear David's scorn for this evil man in the first five verses. This is actually our responsive reading. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. David's hope is that God breaks Doeg for what he's done. The wicked man. Now I haven't really addressed this yet in our sermon series. But there's been a lot of lying a lot of deception happening to keep David alive. Whether it's his wife pretending that David was ill and that had forced her to help him escape, both lies. Or Jonathan's lying to King Saul about why David wasn't attending the, pre the feast in chapter 20. And then we see in chapter 21, verse 2, David lied outright to, the, to Ahimelech about why he had come to Nob. Then verse 13 deceives the people of Gath to think he's insane. Someone actually counted the number of times that deception, lying, is involved in the books of First and Second Samuel. They came up with 28 times, 28 episodes in just 55. Ooh. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. Or Psalm 34, 13, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Is all of this lying just excused because it's for a good cause? That the ends justify the means? Well, I think first we have to acknowledge that the Bible neither excuses nor condemns the lying in these stories. It's merely reporting what happened. Many of the lies seem to accomplish God's will that David stays alive, right? But that doesn't mean that they were the, that was the only way that it could have happened. In fact, I think there's a strong case to be made that if David had told Ahimelech the truth, then the priest would have at least had a choice in whether he helped this fugitive or not. Since he thought he was helping a loyal man of the king, he clearly thought he was doing the right thing. And so then he is blindsided by Saul's anger and accusations later. Now, it's very likely that David was trying to give Ahimelech plausible deniability, right? By not telling him why he was really in town. Maybe if he kept him in the dark, he couldn't admit to it. But in doing that, David unintentionally sealed his fate. We're not being given positive examples in the stories. We're not being encouraged to lie, to get ourselves out of various situations. We're not giving latitude to play fast and loose with the truth. Satan is the father of lies. We should live as children of the light and strive to be truthful in all situations. What do we 
learn additionally from these stories. We're going to keep talking about this, but on Saul's side, we see that our idols, our goals, sometimes our insecurities, our anger, can make us lash out at people, even people that we haven't been in conflict with. Innocent people get hurt. And others get caught in our web of manipulation. I would say the easiest thing for Saul to do at this point in his life is just surrender to the Lord's will that David be given the throne after he dies. But I would also say the hardest thing for Saul to do is to surrender to the Lord's will. And so he's going to keep fighting. On David's side... We're reminded, I see a picture, of that sometimes following the Lord involves us, even if it's metaphorically, sitting in a dark cave, far from home, at our lowest. We struggle with guilt, anger, fear, because our worldly adversaries press in on us. Things get desperate, lonely, and dismal with very little hope. But we don't give up. We look for those around us who will support us and help us in our time of need. And when we come to the sanctuary of God, we come come with all kinds of things happening in our lives, all kinds of circumstances weighing on us. But like David, we need two things. We need bread and we need a sword. What do I mean? John 6, 51, Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And then Ephesians 6, 17, the end of the description of Paul telling us to put on the armor of God, says to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we need bread and a sword. We need Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. The one from whom we draw spiritual nourishment and sustenance. And we need the word of the scriptures to be our weapon against the evil in our own hearts and the evil around us. Our spiritual lives are empty without those two things. No amount of good deeds, positive thoughts, Memorable speeches, great quotes, platitudes, none of that can sustain us through the highs and lows of this life. God's Son, the living Word, and God's holy book, the Word of Truth, are the great gifts that spiritually strengthen us. The Gospel, the story of redemption, boiled down very simply is this. Jesus, the great king, gave up his life for his people. He was not Saul, who looked to kill others to keep his throne. And he was not like David, who had others die protecting him. Jesus surrendered his life willingly for sinful, desperate, lying, fearful, guilty people like you and me. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that the scriptures are written for our edification, that all scripture is breathed out by you, written by faithful men. And thank you for the author of 1 Samuel who recorded the good, the bad, the ugly in David's struggle in that time between being anointed and ascending to the throne. That time when his life was threatened from every direction. A time when he was hunted down. At times, desperate 
lonely, barely escaping with his life. Lord, we're going to use that to encourage us in our dark time, in our dark hours. But remind us that we have hope in all things because Jesus is the great king who gave himself for us. He was not the jealous king who took others' lives. He gave himself for us. We feed on him our true bread from heaven that he gave his body on the cross for us. His blood shed on our behalf so that we would be saved. As dark as life can get, as we look in the news and see atrocities in the world, as we look at horrible things that happen, those do not escape your notice, Lord, we know. But your plan of salvation goes out despite those things. It will bring all things to justice in the end. And so we wait in hope. And we thank you for Jesus and his salvation. We lift all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and close with the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the power and might of his great name. Let us exult on bended knee. Praise God the Holy Trinity. Amen. Receive the benediction from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. And you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Amen. As we said